pray with me this morning as we start? Father God, thank you so much just for uh, this building and this place. Thank you for your, for your love. And Father God, we just want to continue in worship, Lord, by um, looking into your word and your scripture, Lord. We just ask that you would reveal your truth to us. And I just ask that as I uh, come before you, Lord, this is your word, so allow me to step out of myself and into your spirit that you would communicate and talk to us today. In your holy name, amen. This morning, we're starting a new series called The Balancing Act. Now, I don't think I need to tell any of you that life is a balancing act. Amen? It's hard to be a good husband, father, pastor, son, friend, woodworker. It's hard to fill all these things out that make up me. It's hard to do all these things. It's a balance. But I think that it's not important just to balance our tasks and our jobs, but it's also important to balance who we are, to balance our character. In this series, we're going to take two aspects that make up character, and we're going to put them side by side, and they're going to be two things that sometimes seem very separate or contradictory, but life really requires a balance of both of them, kind of like chocolate pretzels. You got a pretzel that is salty and hard and a chocolate that is sweet and soft. And when they come together, magic happens. It's delicious. This morning, we're looking at two words, tough and tender. And it's not just about knowing when to be tough and knowing when to be tender, but how we can be both at the same time. And I think that really... The struggle between tough and tender is really a struggle between power and love. Power in the sense of the control, the authority, the influence that we have, and love as in the compassion and the caregiving that we give. Now I have before you a whiteboard, and as you can see, it's all about the balancing act. And and what I'm going to do on the whiteboard, we're going to throw up on the big screen for those of you that, that can't see, it's okay. And so a lot of times we view this as two very separate things, and then here we are kind of trying to figure out this balancing act in between. But today what I want to try to convince you, today what I want you to see is that these two things are not as separate as they seem. So we have love. And we have power. And I believe that the way that God has laid this down for us is for these two things to be together. Because God himself is omnipotent, which means he's all-powerful, but he is also omnibenevolent, which means that he is all-loving. He's 100% of both. And I think what I've noticed is that power without love is really just manipulation. Love without power is infatuation. But when these two things can come together, when power is grounded in love, when power is rooted in love, it truly can transform us and it can transform the people around us. And I can't speak for you, but me as a husband and as a father and as a pastor, I truly long to make a difference and I believe that that can happen in my life if I can balance these two things together. When power is rooted in love, I can make a difference. When power is rooted in love, I can do that, first of all, by excavating value in the people around me. There's a man that lives in Turkey, and his name is Mustafa Bozdemir. And I apologize to him wherever he is in Turkey if I screwed his name up really bad. But this guy, Mustafa, he inherits a house in Turkey. And I guess because he inherited this house, he said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to do me some renovations. We're going to make this place nice and spiffy. So during these renovations, he's renovating, and he discovers this basement that they didn't know was there when he was knocking a wall down. 
And so he's going down into this basement thinking, hmm, I wonder what's down here. And he discovers an underground city. Just, just imagine this with me for a moment. You decide to renovate your house. And you find a basement, and that's strange enough, but then you explore this basement, and it's an underground city. We have that picture we can show of this underground city. Now, this is the underground city. I'm going to screw this up, too. Dink, Derink, or Yuru, something like that. I'm not, I'm not Turkish, so I apologize. But the next picture actually shows just how incredible this system was. This was under this guy's house. This city was 11 levels deep, has 600 entrances, consists of many miles of tunnels, some of them which connect to other underground cities. They can accommodate thousands of people. There's areas for sleeping, stables for livestock. Are you kidding me? Wells, water tanks, pits for cooking, ventilation shafts, communal rooms, bathrooms, tombs. They got it all down there. I didn't even know this existed. Like, the people lived underground back in the day. This just blew me away. And this guy is discovering it in his basement. Now, we believe the experts tell us that this city was probably dug slash built around 330 to 1400 A.D. So this, it's, it's not like this like appeared. I mean, it's been there for thousand plus years, but it was covered in dirt and hidden until Mustafa found it. He unearthed this city of incredible historic value that had been hidden for years. And I believe that that is exactly what we can do when we get this right, when we can model our lives after God, when we can connect these two things of power and love and bring them together as one. I believe we can do the same for the people around us. We can dig up that value in them. In John 4, there is a story about the woman at the well, or some of you may know it as the Samaritan woman. It's one of my favorite stories. Every time I read it, I see something new. And, and really, it's just a story of, of a woman who goes to this well. She, she's there in the middle of the day, and, and most of the time, she's there by herself, and she encounters Jesus. And this is what happens in John 4, 7 through 9. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman from Samaria? Because Jews and Samarias did not have any dealings with each other. So there's two important things that I want to point out to you. First of all, this woman is, by Scripture we know, she is not the most holy woman. Uh, she has been kind of sleeping around with different men. She goes from man to man. And that's why she's at the well in the middle of the day. It's in the desert, folks. You don't go to the well in the middle of the day. And most of the time when she goes to the well, there's nobody else there. That's the way that she likes it. But this time, Jesus is there. So she's kind of caught off guard a little bit. But then she's even more caught off guard because this Jewish man is speaking to her, which doesn't happen. And it doesn't happen because Samaritans are really, uh, by Scripture, we know they're, they're half-breed or half-blood Jews. And they're not speaking to each other. Because really, I think that it's a reminder of their shame. It's a reminder of their sin. Because there are only, Samaritans only exist because the Jewish people did not listen to God and obey his commandments. So it's a reminder. So they, they just, they don't talk to each other. So there's just this incredible experience where Jesus meets this woman where she is. And I don't know about you, but I, I think I'm blown away by this situation because if it was me, it would look so much different. Because I feel like I tend to see people for their scars, and I tend to, even though I try not to, I tend to judge people for their shortcomings. And too often the status of who I think I am gets in the way of me loving people. But here we see Jesus discards his status of who he is for the favor of love. He didn't see her for who she was. Jesus saw her for who she could be. 
Man, what, what would, it, would it not look so different if we began to do that with the people around us? If we began to see people not for who they are, but if we began to see people for who they could be one day, I think life would look a little bit different. He saw her potential, saw past those scars and, and those shortcomings. And somewhere behind all that dirt, he saw value. And he took the time to begin to dig up some of that dirt and to reveal the value in this, in this woman. And this is what happens, John 4, 39 through 42. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. The whole story is there, but this is, all, this is the only verse you need to know. Because of this woman's testimony, this whole town, many people in this town came to believe in Jesus because of, of her testimony, Jesus saw a diamond where everybody else just saw dirt. And because of who Jesus was, the power that he had, the authority that he had, and the incredible compassion that he had for this woman, he spent time this day to hang out at this well with this woman and to reveal and dig up this value that had been there all along. And I think that we need to follow the example of Jesus and we need to let go of who we think we are to be people of compassion. Be willing to forego our pride to serve the least of these, the weak, the broken, the hard to love, our enemies, the addicted, the unlovely. And the other thing I think we need to let go of, I think we need to let go of who we think God is because God is able so far beyond our comprehension. Because when we would give up on somebody, when we would only see dirt, God sees the whole picture and can work beyond our comprehension. Stephanie's family was in town this past week, and her dad was telling me the story of a woman that's been going to their church. And, and she's kind of been going off and on for a really, really long time, and she's been really struggling with addiction. And she's kind of been going back and forth and back and forth. And this church, they just kind of kept pouring into her and kept pouring in. And she'd show up in, in church one day and she'd look like, man, she's getting it. She's getting figured out. And then next thing, she's right back to where she was. So much so that, that she even began to sell herself so that she had drug money. And it just kept this nasty cycle that kept going back and back and back. But this church never gave up on her. They kept digging and they kept digging and they kept digging. And today... This woman is eight months clean because a church loved her, because a church decided we're not going to give up on her, even though we keep, every time she comes in here, we're disappointed that she's gone right back to where she was. We're not going to give up on her. They saw the value in her. Maybe there's somebody in your life that you've given up on. Maybe there's somebody in your life that you've avoided. Let's, this is church, let's be real honest. How many of us have some people that we've been avoiding? What would it look like if we began to let God help us to see them differently? To let God show us how to best love these people? What would it look like in our lives if we just said, you know what, I'm going to keep digging and I'm going to keep digging until I find value, and I'm not going to give up, and I'm not going to avoid, and I'm going to love these people like Jesus loved me. When power is rooted in love, you can excavate that value from others. Let me give you another one. When power is rooted in love, I believe that we can reveal hope for other people. In John 8, there's a story of a woman that is caught in the act of adultery. And the Pharisees bring her before Jesus. And this is what happens in John 8, 7 through 11. As they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, let him, who is out, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, the Pharisees, when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones, until Jesus was left alone, standing before this woman. 
something before I continue. There's something that you have to understand here. Jesus is the only one left standing there because he is the only one without sin. And he's the only one that had the right to carry out the law to stone this woman. But let's keep reading and see what happens in verse 10. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go from now on and sin no more. Even though Jesus had the right, even though he had the authority, he chooses to give this woman a second chance. Why? Scripture tells us because Jesus did not come to condemn. He came to save. Is anybody willing to admit that at some point in your life, you've needed a second chance? I just took the CDL test, and I needed a second chance. (laughs) I'm a little embarrassed at the score that I had the first time I took it. What what does that do? When when you get that second chance, it gives you so much hope, so much hope that that you don't have to be a failure, that you can change the way things are. And that's exactly what Jesus does for this woman. He, He says, listen, you were caught in the act of this, but this doesn't have to be you anymore. He says, go, you're no longer bound to who you used to be. This is not who you are. You don't have to be this person anymore. Hope exists here in this moment because of forgiveness and grace, because the power to condemn got lost in love. Hope that was birthed from power rooted in love, and it came at a time where she needed it most. I have a a really good friend, and his father is one of 13 kids. Now, I just, for the life of me, I can't even, it's not even, it doesn't comprehend here. 13 kids. I got one, and I'm like, I'm loving it. 13. And my friend was telling me, he's like, you know what? I really want to ask Grandma a question. So he he thinks of this question that he wants to ask his grandma, who's got 13 kids. And I, I think he was trying to trap her, but her answer kind of blew him away. He goes up to his grandma. He says, Grandma, you got 13 kids. Let's get real. Who's the favorite? Okay. Who's the favorite? Who Who do you love the most? And what she said blew him away. She said, I love the child the most that needs me the most at that time. Man, it's powerful. So I want to ask us the question this morning. Think about this. Really think about this. Who needs you the most? Who needs you the most right now? What hope can you give? What power, what authority, what control do you have that you can love somebody through? And I don't think that Jesus was just saving this woman, but I think he was teaching the Pharisees a lesson that too often their dedication to obedience loses love. There's no love in it. And I think the same is true for us. And we got to understand that this grace and forgiveness is powered by love. He's teaching us, folks, we're Pharisees. Hate to be the one to break that to you. We're the religious. God is always trying to to communicate to us not to get lost in religious law, but to just love people. So my question is, who needs your grace today? Who needs your forgiveness? Who in your life needs a second chance? And you know what? Maybe they don't deserve it, but I got a question for you. Did you deserve the cross? Maybe they don't deserve it, but when power is rooted in love, you can reveal such incredible hope for people. Hope that they don't have to be who they used to be. Hope that they can make it right. I want to give you one more. And it's a believe that when power 
and love combine, we become people that intentionally invest. Since becoming a dad, and I, I got to pause for a moment, and I know it's not Mother's Day, but I have to be so thankful for my wife. Uh, she allows me to work and allows me to do that, and she stays home with Malin, and I, for the life of me, I couldn't do it. She's an incredible woman. But there's moments and times where the roles get reversed, and she'll go to work, and I'll stay home with Malin. This happens maybe once a week, and I know that there's times that I really get caught up in just stuff I got to get done. And so I'll be sitting at home with Malin, and I'll be on the phone or doing something, and she'll look at me, and she's like, Daddy, play with me. And so I, in that moment, you know, I put down my phone or put down whatever I'm doing, and I get on my knees, and I get on her level, and I'm like, okay, girl, let's play. And she lights up. She, she just, she's ready, ready to go for it. And I, I really need you guys to understand that that is your story. And this, this is what I want to show you this morning. God created the world in six days. And on the seventh day, he rested. That's what we see here in Genesis 2-2. He rested. But that word rested means put away. So I just, just follow, follow me here for a moment. So we got God, okay? He's creating the world, and the very last thing he does on the sixth day is create us. That's what he does. Then on the seventh day, he rested. He put away. This is what he did for us. He said, I'm going to get all my work done. I'm going to put it away so on the seventh day, I can spend time with my greatest creation. Oh, that's powerful. God of the universe got all his work out of the way so that when we showed up, he could focus and give all of our, his attention to us. Man, that's beautiful. He's been investing in us since day one. His idea was from day one, I got to get this out of the way so I can be with my son, so I can be with my daughter. He's been investing in us from day one all the way to the cross. He's been investing in us because he sees something in us other than dirt. Are we as fathers? Are we as children of God? Are we following in God's footsteps? Are we investing in our spouses? Are we investing in our children, in our family, in our friends? And are we using our influence and authority to invest in the people around us simply because of our love? I want to share with you a quote this morning from a book that I've been reading called Emotionally Healthy Leader. And I'm just going to be real honest. This might sting a little. This piece of scripture, has, or piece of, of word from this guy has really, really, really convicted my heart. I want to share it with you this morning. Most emotionally unhealthy leaders affirm the importance of a healthy intimacy in relationships and a lifestyle. But few, if any, have a vision for their marriage. As a result, they invest the best of their time and energy into becoming better equipped as a leader and invest very little in cultivating a great marriage that reveals Jesus to the world. For example... They might make significant leadership decisions without thinking through the long-term impact those decisions could have on the quality and integrity of their marriage. They dedicate their best energy, thought, and creative efforts to leading others and fail to invest in a rich and full married life. When I read this, I put the book down, and I got on my knees, and I started praying. Because for the first time, I understood that I've been putting other things before my marriage. Because Stephanie was not getting 100% of my effort and my creativity. That was huge to me. So my question for us, and I, 
And I know hopefully you're like, I'm not married, I checked out. No, this is not just about marriage. This is about life. This is about being a good father. This is about being a good friend. Are we investing in the people around us? Because I think it's so easy to get caught up in investing in us and investing in our work. And we have to intentionally invest in others and the ones that we love. But maybe that's just me. But I think regardless of our past, regardless of my past, today I can say it's going to be different. Today I want to start investing in others. And I just want to end with a few ways that we can do that. First and foremost is just to believe in people. Can I tell you that I am standing here today on this Father's Day because Pastor Steve believes in me? Can I tell you that if he didn't believe in me, he would not let me preach on Father's Day? That's just the truth. I'm standing here today because my father that's here, he's believed in me since day one. He's poured into me. He's invested in me. Man, what would it look like just, just to, to, to have somebody that you know, regardless of what happens, regardless of how bad I screw up, regardless of anything, they love me and they believe in me. Man, that's a, that's a game changer. Another thing we can do is pray over people. And not just saying that you'll pray over somebody, but actually praying over them. Even if that means that right there on the spot when somebody asks, you're just like, let's pray right now. Let's so make sure this gets done. I've been really convicted, too, to, to make sure that I'm praying over my daughter, Malin. One of the things, probably the, the only thing that, that really, truly matters to me is her salvation. And so I pray for her salvation every single night, unless I forget. And then I wake up in the morning, and I'm convicted, and I pray for it right there. Because that is so important to me. So I, I pray that, that God would give her the knowledge and truth of who he is. I pray that God would plant friends in her life that guide her to Jesus. And I pray and I pray and I pray and I pray that God would give her a husband that has a heart after God. That is the, the most important thing to me in, in, in all of those things. Is that Malin knows who Jesus is. Are you praying for your children? Are you praying over them? Are you praying for their future? Next thing we can do is walk alongside people. Uh, if you are friends with me, if you follow me on Facebook, you probably know that I get into woodworking quite a bit. And I love to woodwork. It's nice to get away and, and to work with my hands. It's peaceful for me. It's calming. Uh, sometimes I can get a power saw and get some anger out. You know, it just, it's just it's good stuff. But I wouldn't know how to do anything if it wasn't for somebody that taught me how to do it. Somebody walked alongside me, and as I built my first project, was like, no, you do it this way. No, do it this way. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, just like that. We need to be able to do that in our spiritual life with the people that are around us, to live with them, to teach them, to, to share our story with them to invest in them that way. Another thing I believe that we can speak the truth and love into people's lives. Uh, since becoming a father and, and having a daughter, there, there's just been this deep conviction in me from day one that it is my job to tell Malin every day that she's beautiful. And I know that there's a, a, been a couple girls that have been in my ministry who I know don't have fathers that think that way, that don't have Christian fathers, and, and one of them just doesn't even have a father, period. He took off. And so I just felt like it's been, God's convicted my heart to just step in, and, and every now and then when, when he puts those girls in my mind, to just send them a text and say, listen, I want you to know I love you. I want you to know I think you're beautiful. I want you to know I'm proud of you. I'm proud of the woman you're becoming. And you would never, never, never know the power your words can have when you speak that truth into somebody's life. And all it does is, is it's taken, I don't know, five minutes to sit down, to get away by yourself and say, and there's this one person and they need to be encouraged today. 
And the last thing I think that we can do to invest in people is to give people our time. Um, I don't know what all you've been doing and all you've been a part of, and, and maybe you're new today, but uh, the emphasis for us this year is to be rooted in the Word of God. And so we've tried to get a bunch of different things into your hands to help you do that. One of the things that, that I've really loved and appreciated is we have these cards and there's one for each month, and each month has a Rooted in the Word challenge, and it's about taking the Word that we hear and putting it into action, about doing what the Word actually says. And the one for June is comfort. And comfort is all about time. You can't comfort someone unless you take the time to do so. Maybe it's a phone call, uh, maybe it's a hospital visit, maybe it's a visit to the nursing home, taking time to invest in somebody, to say, hey, I'm pausing here for a moment, even though I got a million things to do, I'm pausing here for a moment because you mean the world to me. And you'll never know the impact that'll make on somebody, especially those in the nursing home. Give people your time. This week and and throughout preparing this message and just Today, I've just been praying and praying and praying one specific thing for each and every single one of you. And I've been praying that God would bring one person to your mind. And here, we're going to take a moment of silence, and we're just going to sit in silence. And I want you to take that time to pray to God. And pray to God for that one person. Maybe he's already brought that person to your mind. Maybe he's going to do so in that prayer. But I want you to think of one person. Maybe it's somebody that you need to use your status, use who you are, the power that you have, to dig into their life and to help excavate that value that's in them. Maybe it's grace and forgiveness that somebody needs from you that can bring hope to somebody today. Or maybe just God's going to bring somebody on your mind, somebody that he wants you to invest in somebody that he wants you to pray over, somebody that he wants you to love. And so as we take this time, just just pray to God and, and ask him to bring just one person to your mind today and how you can reveal a powerful love to them. Father God, as we gather here together and and in our silence, we're silent because we need to hear from you. And Father God, I just ask that whether that person's been laid on our heart or they haven't yet, Lord, we just ask that you would. We ask that you would just, just make it so apparent that one person for us to invest in that one person that we can transform by being a person of power and love. Father God, we all come from different likes and and just different areas and, and different walks of life. And we come into so many different people in contact with them. Lord, we just ask that as we leave from this place, Lord, that you would... Help us to see the opportunities that we have to excavate value in others, to reveal hope to others, to give grace and forgiveness, and to invest in others how you have invested in us. Father God, we love you. We praise you. Go with us from this place. Give us the strength and courage to live for you. In your name, amen. As we finish up today, I... It's important for me to just say thank you um, to all of you that are fathers. And I know that father seems like a term that maybe doesn't apply to you. But I just want you to know that I'm here today because of four men that weren't my father. I was at a middle school camp, actually, and they pulled me aside and they spoke into my life. And they said, Will, you're going to be a pastor someday. We see it in you. And I was like, nope, not this guy. 
I lost that battle. Those guys weren't my father, but man, they invested in me and they changed my life. And I just want to say thank you to my dad. Um, Just the the impact that he's had on my life. And I had to wake up for high school at 5.30 every day. And every morning he was up reading his word, digging into the word of God, eating breakfast with me, sending me off. Like even the little things, man, mean so much. So thank you, dad. And and just thank you all of you that that are fathers, whether you know it or not. We lift and celebrate you today. As we leave today, if there's any of you that are uh, new, uh, we'd love a chance to meet you. Steve and I will be at the Welcome Center. Thank you for being here today. Uh, As you go, go with the Lord. Be blessed. Thank you.